Good evening. I'm uh, Steve Weberg with the um, uh, public affairs staff here of the uh, Kansas City Public Library, and, and I really want to thank all of you for coming here tonight. And, and I want to thank the, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College for its partnership on what has been just a tremendously successful Hollywood versus history series. And um, of course, they might be the only, there's not a lot of ways that we can counter program the Chiefs and the Raiders, but the, <laughs> the, the, the Command and General Staff College is our best bet, and you guys are, are, are proof of that. Um, if, if you're like me, uh, you really just marvel at the depth um, of the lineup of accomplished military historians that, that the college has and, and how fortunate we are, we the library, we all of you, to, to, to have them available to us for, for these kinds of programs. Mark Hull is the 10th different presenter in the 10 month history of this Hollywood versus history series. And there's really nobody better, nobody more qualified to assess the historical accuracy of the, the film that we're spotlighting tonight, uh, the widely admired and, and acclaimed uh, Judgment at Nuremberg, which is a fictionalized account of the, the third in the succession of trials of Nazi German leaders after World War II. Uh, Mark's a former Army military intelligence officer in Iraq, who's now a professor in the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College. And there he specializes in war crimes prosecution and military law. He holds a doctorate in German history and World War II from University College Cork in Ireland. And he has a law degree from Sanford University's Cumberland School of Law. Last year, he was named a fellow with the National Institute of Military Justice, the only non-governmental agency in the United States that's dedicated to the study and improvement of our country's military justice system. Now, Mark spoke about the Nuremberg trials at the Central Library back in 2016, and it's just great to have him back here with us. And, and his is a, a timely presentation in, in a couple of respects. Uh, the real life trial, um, uh, this particular trial over the course of the, I think, dozen Nuremberg trials, uh, this one was in 1947. It was known as the judges or the jurist trial. It focused on officials with, the, um, with Germany's Ministry of Justice and German prosecutors and judges who were accused of crimes against humanity for sentencing innocent people to their deaths, ostensibly at the behest of the Nazi government. And it was 75 years ago this month, uh, in, uh, on October 18th, actually, 1947, that, that prosecutors and the defense uh, finished their closing statements in, in this trial, and then the verdicts were handed down in December. Now, unfortunately, the, the issue of, of war crimes and other atrocities is newly resident, resonant today. As, as Russia continues its, uh, its brutal assault uh, in Ukraine. As always, we're gonna have time for a few questions at the end of the program, and uh, we'll ask you, we'll set up microphones here in the front and, and ask, uh, ask you to, to please use those microphones. Don't shout out questions from the audience. Mark's been instructed to just shout you down. Uh, but that's because we are uh, recording, uh, recording this event and, you know, people who are listening to the tape later on aren't going to be able to hear the question. They're just going to hear blank noise. Um, and also, uh, related to that, since we, since we aren't live streaming tonight, the video of this presentation will be available on the library's YouTube channel, and it's just simply YouTube slash KC Library. So, if there's somebody you know who wanted to be here, maybe they are an arrowhead, um, and, and, and couldn't be here, uh, or somebody you know that really would be interested in, in this particular uh, presentation or interested in this particular subject, give them a heads up. It is available and will be available for a long time on our YouTube channel. And then finally, uh, you, you may have missed it coming in, but there's a table set up in the back, and, and Mark, 
uh, Mark was nice enough to, he, he brought the actual studio uh, press pamphlet for the film, Judgment in uh, Nuremberg, and uh, has it back there for you guys to look at uh, if you wanted to take a few minutes to, to, to thumb through it, it, and it's on a table in the very back there. Um, once again, thank you all so much uh, for being here. Uh, again, we know you have uh, had other viewing options tonight. We love it that you're here with us. Uh, and I want you to uh, ask you to please join me in welcoming Mark Hall back to the Kansas City Public Library. Mark. Uh, hello and thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight to talk to you about the film Judgment at Nuremberg. But I should confess, I think, at the beginning that you probably couldn't pick a worse person to watch a lawyer movie with than me. Uh, the way this usually goes, and it, many of you can maybe testify to this, it starts with uncomfortable body language and it progresses pretty rapidly into me yelling the words objection or... <laughs> leading or something at the TV screen, and, and that's why probably I don't have as many friends as I should have. But. <laughs> so in some ways, I'm the perfect person to do a, a takedown of the movie Judgment at Nuremberg. The problem is I, I love this film, and I'd like to explain to you why you should also love it. Uh, it's one of three films I can think of off the top of my head that were I think instrumental on me deciding that I wanted to be a lawyer. Two of those movies are produced, or excuse me, directed by Stanley Kramer, the director of the, this film. Both of those films involve Spencer Tracy in the leading role. And I just, it's one of these films, and Steve and I were talking before we started tonight, that <clears throat> if I'm flipping through the channels and I see that this is on, and I've seen it, I don't know how many, because I, I use it in class, so I must have seen the movie 50, 60 times. I will stop what I'm doing, and for the rest of the time the film is on, that has become my new project. I'm going to watch it. So with that caveat, or with that explanation, uh, let's go ahead and get going, because we have, have places to go. In a proper comparison of history versus Hollywood, you know, we need to do the history piece. So let, let's go ahead and we'll use that as our foundation. This is not the International Military Tribunal, which was the main trial it held at Nuremberg uh, from 1945 to 1946. It is rather part of what is called the NMT trials, the Nuremberg Military Tribunals, it's, which is a series of 12 trials held after the main trial concluded. And each trial is devoted into, if you like, a theme or a group of defendants. Whereas the main trial had representatives of the different branches of the Nazi state, the NMTs could focus more generally with more defendants on a single point. So in the case of United States versus Josef Alstadter, it is the case where we're looking just at the German judiciary and their role in different aspects of criminality during the Nazi regime. Uh, trial is March through December 1947. The film fudges it a little bit and puts it in 1948, but the real thing happens in 47. Uh, we sit, again, I'm sorry, uh, re repetitive, so the difference between the International Military Tribunal and the Nuremberg Military Tribunals. And the difference, too, is that the, the chief counsel uh, in Nuremberg is now a General Telford Taylor. And I can't say enough things about him, both as a trial lawyer as well as just a moral human being who goes on to, to extraordinary things after he leaves Nuremberg. Uh, he is one of a handful of people that publicly come out and criticize McCarthy in the 1950s, and that probably cost him a seat on the Supreme Court. Uh, but a remarkable attorney. So initially there are 16 defendants at what is going to be called either the judge's trial or the justice trial. Uh, 16 goes down to 15 pretty quickly because one of the defendants, uh, Westphal, uh, commits suicide in his cell. Nuremberg had kind of a problem with people suiciding themselves. Uh, you have 
Julius Stryker in the main trial and Hermann Goering, who commits suicide the night before he's to be executed. I can think of probably four or five others that, that also committed suicide. And now we're down to 15 defendants. Their crimes, and we'll break it down here in a second, are the facilitating role that the German judiciary plays in war crimes and crimes against humanity, specifically aimed at things that they're doing to German citizens. Whereas in the main trial, the focus is on th things that they're doing to non-Germans, and there's a limit in the main trial in terms of how far back we can go in, 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 with Nazi criminality in, in the courtroom. And it's subtle, and I also think that it's important. So crime one is a conspiracy count, uh, crime two is war crimes using the judiciary and the penal process to commit mass murder, torture, and plunder of private property. Uh, crime number three is the crime against humanity that was induced or introduced in the Nuremberg trials, the, the, the main trial, uh, to include slave labor. And lastly, membership in a criminal organization, and we're defining criminal organization as organizations that were declared criminal by the main IMT. Meaning, if you are a member of the SS, congratulations, you're guilty after that. So it is the, the least burdensome charge to prove. All I need is your membership card and proof that you joined voluntarily, and you're now guilty of count four. The defendants here, and we'll come back and look at their pictures a little bit later. So this is your rogues gallery. These are the surviving highest ranking people in the German judiciary. In things like normal German criminal courts, two other kinds of courts that are specially created by the Nazis called special courts or the people's court. And these last two are where some of the interesting things happen that, that show up later in the movie. So for example, crimes that are specific to persecutions of Jews or crimes that are aimed at treason, or other high crimes that the Nazis promulgate. There's a famous series of trials that happens at the People's Court in Berlin uh, after the Stauffenberg bomb plot, and we're also gonna come back and touch on a little bit of that as well. But I think it's important too to get the idea of what is going on with the Nazi state in the 1930s. So they are thoroughly not only anti-Semitic since the founding of the party in 1919, but as the 1920s go on and we get to the 1930s, they start sort of broadening their reach. And one of their ideas is the purity of the Aryan race. And the logical consequence of that is that you can't have purity of the Aryan race unless there are no competitors, there's no way to pollute the Aryan race. So if you live in Germany in the 1930s, you would have been bombarded by messages and posters and talks and radio broadcasts that are aimed at eugenics and the health of the community and the health of men and women and children. So for example, on this right-hand side screen, uh, you're, you're saying, you know, you don't want to be responsible. You don't want to be guilty of polluting the, the health of the German people. And the way that you do that, and this is very, very, very much a predicate for what's going to go on in, in a couple different programs before we get to the Holocaust, is a program starts in Germany almost immediately after the Nazis take place of sterilization. And it's not just a question of sterilizing people that you think, and, and this is part of it, but not all of it, you think that are somehow mentally deficient, or you think have inheritable diseases, and they do both of these things in large numbers. But what they find, and this is, comes out in the trial, is what the, the, the German judges and the, the medical community generally are doing. They're sterilizing people w with beliefs that they, with which they disagree. Uh, it is difficult to get hard numbers on this. We're probably talking minimum 300,000 people get sterilized during the Nazi regime. 
And again, this is a coordination between the medical establishment as well as the judiciary. Um, there is a point, though, that we should make, which is that when the film premieres in 1961, 31 U.S. states have similar laws of sterilization. Sterilization for what is perceived as uh, mental deficiency, sterilization for a criminal behavior, sterilization for a wide variety of things. This is not something you know long ago and far away. It, it, it has relevancy. Uh, and the second part that we need to understand too, and this is this is coming after what are called the Nuremberg Laws, are are published in September 1935 at the Nazi party rally. The Nuremberg Laws define specifically who is and who is not a Jew, and to what degree you're a Jew. So are you a full Jew? Are you a quarter, half Jew? Are you a quarter Jew? And what does that really mean? And in practice, what it means is that there are it's the degrees to which you're going to be separated from the German national community. You, you no longer will be employed in professions. You will no longer be able to go to schools. You will no longer be able to do a zillion different things that you wouldn't even think twice about in normal society, except now Jews are cut off from that. Part of the application of the Nuremberg trials is a, a crime called Rassenschande, which means uh, race defilement. It becomes a criminal offense prosecuted by a German special court if a non-Jew has sexual relations with a Jew. It is essentially a, a one to two year sentence, uh, possibly for the woman if she denies it for perjury. Uh, penalties for the Jew who's committing it can range from many years imprisonment to life imprisonment, and to one case in particular that's referenced in the movie, to death. Uh, the famous scene with Judy Garland where she's talking, where she has her a very emotional scene, that really happened at, at, at the uh, Nuremberg Military Tribunal. It's not fiction. And the case involved, his, his photograph here is in the bottom left-hand side, a Nuremberg resident named Leo Katzenberger, who is a uh, fairly well-known person in the Jewish community, and he is accused by someone, and this never comes clear who exactly filed the, the complaint against him, of having improper, i.e. sexual relations with a German girl named Irena Zeiler. Um, the case is brought to court, uh, he, she is, she denies it, so therefore she is sentenced to prison for, for just denying that it happened. And he's initially sentenced to, I forget how many, many years, five years or so, for the crime. But then it is considered again, and they realize that five years is not enough for this. So they tack on a sentencing enhancement because it is said now, after the fact, that the crime of, of contact occurred during a blackout during, for Allied air raids. And the punishment for that is, is death. So Leo Katzenberger is beheaded in Nuremberg for a crime that almost certainly didn't commit, facilitated by the German judiciary working with the Nazi party to use legal means to, to to hurt people and to kill them. And the same thing with the sterilization program, which in turn leads, the Nazis had kind of a learning curve. And they're pushing boundaries of things to sort of see what's going to happen. So in the case of the sterilization program, which is the first thing, there's no general outcry. There's no guardrail. And it, it comes later in the 1930s when the Nazis introduced the euthanasia program. So sterilization wasn't enough of an answer. And in a program that is called the T4 program, Action T4 is the widespread nationwide program to identify and murder anyone who has physical and mental disabilities. 
and they send them to a series of killing facilities supervised by people that will later go on to work at Treblinka and Belzec and Auschwitz. So it's not just an isolated thing. This is part of, 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 of the road. And the road is staffed and greased by people inside the German judiciary who are educated. And they're not abnormal. They're not, they would all pass a, a psychological evaluation. And that's one of the important things that we're going to get to in the film in terms of like what, what the movie means and what the experience meant and how we should understand it. But keep in mind, too, I think my central point here is this is not something that, that is only applicable to the 1930s or to 1961. It, it works remarkably well in 2022. So the genesis of the film is kind of cool. Uh, Screenwriter Abby Mann has a accidental meeting with General Telford Taylor, who had been the chief prosecutor at the, at the Nuremberg Military Tribunals who gives him the idea that this could make a good script. And Abby Mann uh, sells it. Uh, it appears on CBS, finally, as on, on a series called Playhouse 90, Judgment at Nuremberg, starring the uh, first left, lower left-hand picture from maybe the greatest movie ever made, Casablanca. Anybody? Claude Rains played the role that Spencer Tracy is going to take in Judgment at Nuremberg. I love Claude Rains. Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, one of the interesting things is that the show Playhouse 90 is sponsored by the American Gas Corporation. So when you get to the line in the script that talks about Jews and gas ovens, they censor the script, and you see characters' lips moving and no sound coming out. Because <laughs> American Gas Company, no like. And, but, so that's kind of the end of it. And it is then that Stanley Kramer, the director, picks it up. And Kramer is, is a remarkable uh, director in the sense that he his career seems to go in the sense that like he makes like these big movies that make a lot of money and then that buys him the credibility to make other films that he just wants to make and then he's going to have to make another movie a little bit later on that makes a bunch of money to in the use so that's sort of the theme of, of, of his professional life and he gets interested in the script after in the movie after talking to Abby Mann and he goes to United Artists and says hey listen I've got a great idea and United Artists hates it. Who is going to sit there and watch a movie about war crimes and the Nuremberg trials? When you could go and pick anything else that's appearing at the same time. Uh, this movie comes out, by the way, at the same time as West Side Story. Well, you leave feeling sort of happy otherwise, and so the studio hates it. And Kramer says, well, okay, uh, here's the thing. I, I've uh, can bring Spencer Tracy. He's already talked to him. And the studio goes, OK. And Spencer Tracy, that currency is good anywhere. You know, he's never going to have to pay for a meal in Hollywood. Uh, he, he's going to bring people to the box office. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, the movie runtime is three hours and six minutes. So, like, you know, when I'm telling you, like, if you're you know playing through like Turner Classic Movies on on a, on a Saturday, and you get near the front of the movie, and you re now rearrange your day around this film, you're going to be there a while. But it's a good, well spent three hours and six minutes. Um, the movie cost three million dollars to make it, compared to what the things cost now. That's a, a steal. And it made 12 million, but I think that's over the life of the film. So I'm not right. The Kramer talks in his book that that it didn't make very much money. Uh, usually, in cases like this, you're counting on a pretty healthy overseas market, and and that for for a couple different reasons really didn't transpire. So the studio didn't wasn't terribly pleased, but it made enough to where Kramer was okay, and he could go on to make other movies. Uh, things to look for in the film. Uh, Captain Kirk, 
Uh, William Shatner, in one of his first movie roles, plays a captain who is an aide to Spencer Tracy's character, Judge Hayward. Uh, Colonel Klink shows up as a defendant. Uh, Werner Klemperer, uh, who's uh, Jewish, uh, is a refugee. His father was a tremendous director and violinist. And he has a, a, a very convincing role in the movie and being an authentic German, he, he, he lends some gravitas to this idea. Uh, the film premieres in 1961 at the Congress Halle in, in Berlin. Uh, Billy Brandt, the mayor, gives a very, very welcoming speech and the movie then proceeds to drop like a stone in German theaters. Uh, it's shown at a handful of places and nobody goes to see it. It is not well received and frankly in 61 you can kind of maybe understand why that would be. Uh, one of the other stars of the film, Marlena Dietrich, uh, she did not and would not attend the premiere in Berlin. She had been back to Dusseldorf doing like a review show in 1960 and was not, she didn't like the, the reception she got so she refused to ever go to Germany again. We'll come back more to this. There's a cool thing to know about her a little bit later when, when, when we're going to show here clips of the movie. Uh, the movie in itself wins uh, two major awards. Uh, Maximilian Schell, who's the German-Swiss actor uh, who plays the German defense attorney in the movie, uh, he wins best actor. And this was not great. Some decisions when Academy Award nominations were, were came out because Tracy and Shell were nominated for Best Actor in the same picture. And it went to Shell, and I think he, 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 he readily deserves it, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. And Abby Mann, of course, won for Best Screenplay. But at the same time, you're up against West Side Story, so you're going to take some licks on this and, and not, you know, not sweep the Oscars. Uh, the movie opens, you've got a, a musical interlude and there's actually a song from the First World War that sounds very sort of martial and very typically German and then you get this nice visual at the, the, uh, the at the Nuremberg, uh, it's called uh, Zeppelin Field of the, where the United States Third Army blew up the swastika on top of the of, of, the, of the building right behind where, where Hitler's podium used to stand, or still stands. Mm -hmm. Uh, the movie, there are a couple weeks worth of shooting that occur in, in Germany. Uh, they had originally, Abby, or excuse me, Kramer had originally wanted to use courtroom 600, which is where the trials were held, but it was still a working courtroom and they couldn't. Uh, it is still, or until re very, very, very recently, it was still a working courtroom, and now it's just going to be part of, of the Nuremberg uh, exhibit when you go to the Palace of Justice. So you get these scenes of, of Spencer Tracy at the, the Nuremberg Party rally site, again, where those Nuremberg laws were, were, were promulgated. Uh, I love these back scene or photographs of, of the cast. Um, you get, everybody loved Marlena Dietrich who worked on this film. Uh, she's relaxed, she sings, and she plays cards, and she gambles, and she smokes, and they just, they loved, and they just loved, everybody loved working with her. Uh, they're doing a table read here. And they just seem like they're having a good time. And I think they were. So it's remarkable what they were able to accomplish in 12 weeks of, of principal photography. Um, just kind of like the behind the scenes of how the movie was made. So in the brief interval where they are working in Germany, they do, again, the sites at the Nuremberg Rally, at the, at the Zeppelin Field. Uh, they go to the Marktplatz in Nuremberg, um, where Tracy buys a brooch and, 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 and a verst, and he talks with this pretty girl. And the scene where this is set is almost exactly the same place where Hitler used to park his car when he reviewed troops and SS and SA people during the Nuremberg rallies. Um, the thing is, when I saw this movie first, and I don't know how old I was, uh, and I had been to Courtroom 600, I cannot tell the difference between the real courtroom and the one that's made in, I, I had assumed that they'd filmed, filmed it there. 
and they didn't. Uh, courtroom 600, again, is off, uh, off limits for filming, but they recreated on the Universal Studios lot a, a perfect, I mean perfect recreation of Courtroom 600. Uh, and there's so many cool details that one of the, 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 the new things that happened at the International Military Tribunal that carried over was simultaneous translations in, at, the, at the IMT in Russian, French, English, and German. So since the, the Nuremberg Military Tribunals are American only, there's no Russians, there's no French, there's no British, um, you only have to worry about German and English. But if you watch the, the movie, they, they, they use the headphones when they're supposed to use the headphones, with one exception, and not when you're, you're both people are speaking in the same language. And to get over the fact that, you know, it's a movie about Germans at a trial, and a lot of the original language was in German, what they do just beautifully, there's a cut scene where Maximilian Schell, the defense attorney, is talking, and they turn away, and they turn back, and he switches seamlessly in the middle of a sentence from German into English, and the rest of the film continues in English. It's, it's, just, it's just great, I just, I just love watching it. Uh, the scene on the right-hand side there, is a scene that never made it into the movie, but it's where uh, Colonel Lawson is interviewing Montgomery Cliff's character. Uh, uh, scene on the bottom, Maximilian Schell, I guess, gets to be holding the handbag guy uh, with Judy Garland and Spencer Tracy and Burt Lancaster. So there's our verst and uh, Mark Plot scene. And again, the scene, the picture on the right there. If you look, there's a mar the green marble surrounds that go to the different doors in courtroom 600, and they have perfectly recreated exactly what they look like. And you know, the weird thing about it, and the, one of the things I really I value is that nobody would have known the difference if you hadn't done it to this degree of of of, of exactness. Nobody would have cared. But they didn't cut that corner. They, they, they're, there's so many different things in here where they, they get it right, even to the point where they get it right just for the sake of getting it right. All right, so the scene we're going to look at now is um, fairly early in the movie. And the reason I've included it here to show you is it's one of the first scenes where you get Spencer Tracy and Marlena Dietrich together. They're walking, actually, this is the scene uh, it's on the Universal back lot. This isn't folk, uh, done in Germany. Um, they're going to be walking toward the camera, and almost immediately you're going to hear the sounds of a song, Lily Marlene. Lily Marlene is a, uh, the, the lyrics were from the First World War. It was recorded in, in 1938 or 39, I think, and it was a favorite on German radio to, to German soldiers. But uh, Josef Goebbels, the propaganda minister, hated it because the lyrics are sad and fatalistic, and he refused to have it played. But so many soldiers demanded it that they were eventually forced to bring it back. Marlena Dietrich, who is working for the Office of Strategic Services, because she's a refugee. She, she leaves Germany in 1933 when Hitler comes in. She, working for the U.S. government, records this version of this song to be broadcast on a fake German station back into Germany as part of a propaganda campaign. And it's the definitive version of this song. It's, it's just, I mean, a lot of people have recorded it. Uh, Vera Lynn and Lolly Anderson and Connie Francis, weirdly. Um, but Marlena Dietrich, is, it's just perfect, and she's talking about the song as she's walking with Spencer Tracy. So in terms of like relationship to war crimes and, and, and the trial, no. But it's just a beautifully captured scene that, that shows the interaction between these two characters and makes both of them appear interesting and human. Let's, let's listen in. German people love to sing, no matter what the situation. I've noticed that. Do American people sing in bars, too? I have forgotten. No, we have to be pretty solemn in bars. Und alle Leute 
I wish you understood, Jim. The words are very beautiful. Very sad. Much sadder than the, the English words. The German soldier knows he's going to lose his girl. And his life. The lantern burns every night. It knows your steps. And the way you walk. It burns every night, but I've been long forgotten. Should harm come to me, who will stand with you under the lantern with you, Lady Marley? So the second scene that I want to show you, and let's talk about it for a second. Uh, I had mentioned a few minutes ago the case of Leo Katzenberger and the, the defendant, Irena Zeiler. Uh, so he is the Jewish man executed. She is the woman that he's said to be have, have sexual contact with. She testifies at the justice trial, and it's about as m emotional reading her testimony as they show it in, 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 in this situation. Judy Garland is playing Irena Zeiler. At this point in her career, she has not worked professionally in f five years since A Star is Born because she has a reputation that is mostly deserved about being a, a very difficult actress to work with because she's undergoing a very severe mental, emotional uh, breakdown, if you like, uh, she is drinking, she is taking pills, but Kramer realizes that she can give a performance that nobody else can give. So she's already testified and now is going to come the point in the trial where she's cross-examined by uh, the German defense attorney. And his point here with her is to, he kind of wants to break her on the witness stand on cross-examination. But he is also trying to show, both in this witness and another one we're going to see him handle, that the underlying thing is true. So it isn't that it was just awful. It's that, in fact, the Nazis kind of got it right as his way of discrediting the witness. And I think Judy Garland, in this moment, she's only you know, on, on, on film for not very much of this movie, I think gives the performance of her life. Uh, it's raw, it's real, and she had, uh, it was very emotional for her to give it. Although there was a weird story that Montgomery Clift, who has his own problems, we'll get to him in a little bit, uh, is off stage while she's giving, doing this scene, and he starts crying. And he's huddled up in a ball. And Stanley Kramer goes over to him to console him and, 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 and ask him if he's okay. And he says, yeah, he says, but she, she, she did that all wrong. He was crying because he thought her, she was terrible. <laughs> he's not. He's, he's, okay, anyway, so what we're going to see here is that. And so the cross-examination, and further, Shell brings something th to this movie that is not the product of the director or the script. There is a rise in his voice when, right as he's questioning her that is a deliberate echo of the same quality of voice that the People's Court judge had in 1944 and 1945. It's, just listen for it and, and you'll hear it, but this, the cadence and, and this, this high rising tone is I think maybe one of the reasons that he, he got the, the award for best actor. The Nuremberg laws were stated September 15, 1935. Where were you at that time? In Nuremberg. Did you know these laws? Were you aware that the physical relationship with Jews was against the law? Yes. Were you aware that in Nuremberg, and in Nuremberg in particular, not only a physical relationship with Jews was viewed with disdain, but every social contact? Yes. Were you aware that it might have some danger for you personally? Yes, I was aware of it. But how can you discard a friendship from day to day because of some... That is another question, Miss Wilder. I did not ask you that question. Were you aware of it? 
Yes, I was aware. And yet you still continue to see each other? Yes. Remember, it was brought out at the tribunal that Mr. Feldstein bought you things. Candy and cigarettes? Yes. Remember that sometimes he bought you flowers? Yes, he bought me many things. That was because he was kind. He was the kindest man I ever knew. Did Mr. Feldstein come to see you at your apartment? Yes. How many times? I don't uh, remember. Several times? Yes. Many times? Many times. Did you kiss him? Yes, I kissed him. Was there more than one kiss? Yes. But it was not in the way you are trying to make it sound. So there's one thing, too, if you notice the way that, that it was filmed. OK, so we, there's a 360 that's done around the podium. What they used was something that looks remarkably like a segue. It's a described circle around the podium. And it's, it's, it had to be very kind of de delicately handled. But it's a wonderful way of, of getting different perspectives from the same you know, continuous shot. Um, as I said, like Judy Garland, OK, this is, I think, the, the, the best, maybe the, the best thing she's, she ever did. Um, let's come back to our next scene, which is, I think, remarkable for a couple different reasons. Defense attorney here is trying to discredit the witness, again, by, by trying to show that, in fact, the reason that he was sterilized is because he was feeble-minded. Uh, if you think back to those posters I showed you earlier, this term in German, Schwachsinnig, is just, it's, it's hereditary feeble-mindedness. So what he's going to have to show is the witness is not in possession of his mental faculties, ergo the Nazis were absolutely correct to sterilize him. And as a prosecutor, this is the last thing on earth you want to see from your witness on cross. So you've already done your direct examination, and now your witness is being cross-examined by the other side. And, and this is a, just a blow-up. It's like you not only have you, man, it's like somebody poured some gasoline and lit a fire here. This is just bad, bad news for the prosecutor. But at the same time, the defense attorney, the way the testimony comes out is you, you feel remarkably sorry for, for the person on the stand. And you're left with not really sure what to think about it. The actor here is going to be in the stand is Montgomery Clift. Um, like Garland, he is, he's got some emotional and mental problems. Uh, he'd been in a car accident several years earlier. It had to have reconstructive plastic surgery. He drinks to excess. He takes pills. Uh, his, mental frame of, his mental state is so bad that when they get him to, to run through and do rehearsals, he can't remember any of his lines. And Kramer, they go back and they go forth, and he just can't seem to, 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 to work it. And even though they're writing things on, on cards so to help him, he can't do it. So what uh, Stanley Kramer eventually says is, look, just ad lib this. And he was told to look at Tracy and do sort of like a table read, and that's just the raw cut you get. So you get not only the character as written, you get Montgomery Clift, who is in an incredibly emotionally fragile state of mind. And again, like Garland, I think this is the best performance he ever gave. So let's take a little bit of a look at that. You say your parents died of natural causes. Yes. Would you describe in detail the illness your mother died of? She died of her heart. In the last stages of her illness, did your mother show any mental peculiarities? Of men? No. No. In the decision that came down from Stuttgart, it is stated that your mother suffered from hereditary feeble-mindedness. That is not, that's not true, not true, not true. Can you give us some clarification as to how the hereditary health court in Stuttgart arrived at that decision? It was just something they said to put me on the operating table. It was just something they said? Yes! They had already made up 
When I walked into the court, they had made up their minds. They had made up their minds. They put me in the hospital like a criminal. I could not say anything. I could not do anything. I, I had to lay there. My, my mother, what you say about her, she was a woman, a servant woman who worked hard. She was a hard-working woman. And it is not fair, not fair what you say. I have here. I want to show you. I have here her, pic her picture. I would like you looked at it. I would like you to judge. Uh, I want that you tell me, was she feeble-minded? My mother, was she feeble-minded? Was she? I, I never had a witness try to show the judge a picture of his mother, but I'm convinced that that wouldn't be a good day for if, if that happens. But I think it, it's, it's a nuanced portrait of, of, of both the sterilization procedure as well as what's going on in the courtroom. So the prosecution contention here is that Mr. Peterson, Montgomery Cliff's character, wah, <laughs> was, <laughs> was uh, sterilized because he was a communist or came from a communist family. And the defense, and the reason the, the, the questioning is gonna go on the way, it, the way it does is the defense attorney's attempt to say, no, 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 he wasn't sterilized because he was a communist, he was sterilized because he was mentally deficient. And it's unclear in the movie which way that that cut, and I think that's an interesting choice to make because a lesser director would have just played it one way. And, and that's not what happens here. Um, the, Last scene, actually next to last, because there's, and there's one very tiny one I want to show you here at, at the very end, I think is probably the most important scene of the movie. So in other words, if, if you've got like chores you've got to do or stuff and, and, and the movie's running on TCM and you need to make sure you're back, be back for this. Because it, it's, it's so nuanced and it's so layered and there's so much in here. In a, in, in the writing is just beautiful. Spencer Tracy is going to try to explain what the trial is about, and he's also going to try to explain that in so many ways this is not about just the Germans and what they did. The trial proceeding, of course, is, but that the mentality of what Nazism was isn't just confined to Germany. And he talks about responsibility, and he talks about some other things, but I think that, that there is, well, why ruin this with me running my mouth? Why, why don't we listen to Spencer talk? Yawning's record and his fate illuminate the most shattering truth that has emerged from this trial. If he and all of the other defendants had been degraded perverts, if all of the leaders of the Third Reich had been sadistic monsters and maniacs, then these events would have no more moral significance than an earthquake or any other natural catastrophe. But this trial has shown that under a national crisis, ordinary, even able and extraordinary men can delude themselves into the commission of crimes so vast and heinous that they beggar the imagination. No one who has sat through the trial can ever forget them. Men sterilized because of political belief, a mockery made of friendship and faith, the murder of children. How easily it can happen. There are those in our own country, too, who today speak of the protection of country, of survival. A decision must be made in the life of every nation at the very moment when the grasp of the enemy is at its throat. Then it seems that the only way to survive is to use the means of the enemy, to rest survival upon what is expedient, 
to look the other way? Well, the, the answer to that is survival is what? A country isn't a rock. It's not an extension of oneself. It's what it stands for. It's what it stands for when standing for something is the most difficult. Before the people of the world, let it now be noted that here in our decision, this is what we stand for. Justice, truth, and the value of a single human being. The core, and, and I apologize because we have limited time, so a lot, there's so much in here I, I wish I could show you. There had been pressure brought on Judge Hayward to reduce the sentences by American officials because, of course, West Germany is going to come back as a, as a, as a country in 1949, um, that we need their help because communism is now threatening Europe and there needs to be an end to war crimes trials. So he's making the moral decision, I don't care about that. What I care about is what these people have done. And he, sentences, he essentially maxes them out on, on sentencing, much to the displeasure of the Americans, which is a realistic enough look at what actually happened after World War II. So there's a period where you get a lot of people tried, both at the NMT and other proceedings by, by the different allies. And then the allies decide they needed to be quickly out of the denazification business. So there's a conscious choice made to put, these, put crimes and the Holocaust and this stuff aside and focus on the Cold War. So there's that certain aspect of the film also. I think the definitive moment of the film, if it isn't Judge Hayward's speech here, and it probably is, is at the very last full scene of the movie, and it's a very short one. Um, Yanning, who's played by Burt Lancaster, asked Judge Hayward to come visit uh, Spencer Tracy, and he does. And Yanning is saying, listen, you know, I admire your, 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 your principle and your moral stand and what you did, and I want you to know that even as one of the defendants you sentenced. And Yanni's position here, in, in real life, there's a, there's a quasi counterpart to the real trial. The defense is that had I not gone along, had I not done the thing that, that I did, they would have replaced me with somebody else who was worse. And, and I wish this was the only time you see this in war crimes cases, but it's just not. There are you, we would flood the auditorium with, with versions of this. And I think Spencer Tracy's answer to this is one of the most perfect things that's ever been in a script coming out of a major studio. Let's listen in. What you said in the courtroom, it needed to be said. Judge Haywood. The reason I asked you to come those people those millions of people I never knew it would come to that you must believe it you must believe it hey Yana it came to that the first time you were sentenced a man to death you knew to be innocent And thus the movie ends, except for one thing. There's an inner scene uh, card that goes right after this that talks about, as of right now, meaning 1961, of the 99 people sentenced in, in the Nuremberg military tribunals, not one is currently serving their sentence. And they were right about that. They were right about a lot more than 99. Um, this is just, it's a thing I have, I didn't bring this today, I apologize, but this is, you know, the, the German great premiere that never quite happened. This is the, the thing that was supposed to publicize it. Uh, after the war, and after the movie, uh, there is a play, plays on Broadway, Judgment in Nuremberg, 
and because all the principals have died. So the Montgomery Cliff, this was his last great performance. He dies in 1966. Uh, Spencer Tracy dies in 1967. Judy Garland in 69. Uh, when they later make this back or into a theater production, Maximilian Schell, who played the German defense attorney, he now has taken the place of Burt Lancaster's character, and he's brilliant. He's, he's really good at it. Uh, it didn't have a very long run. Uh, it should have. So since we're doing movie history versus Hollywood, let me quickly uh, blitz through this. Uh, this feels right. Having the, the trial tr actual trial transcript is, is available, and if you want to have a look at it, it's long. Uh, thankfully, I have done the reading for you, so you don't, you don't have to do that. Uh, it is it is right. It just feels it, it feels correct. Uh, the trial lasts many months. This movie lasts three hours, but they they get they get it right. Um, this idea that the defendants aren't monsters, they are normal people, and that's the scary part. That if they were monsters, it's less scary, but if they're not, it's really scary. Meaning it's not anybody can do this. Anybody could be the yawning character. Anybody could be one of the other defendants. You don't have to be a, 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 a nut job Nazi. What you have to be is somebody who's willing to, to, to do what they tell you. Uh, the moral issues, we, we sort of, we've hit the, the wave tops on this, but they, these are important, they're important then, and they really are really, really important now. Um, they take so much of the film, the script, from the actual trial transcript. It's faithful to that, and I, and I think that, that says quite a bit, and I wish there were more movies of, of that caliber. Um, and they get the part in that, that the Americans themselves, more so even than the Germans, are trying to move the, the Nuremberg military tribunals along. Get them over with, let's put this in the rearview mirror. We have Soviet Cold War things to think about and, and the great disservice that did to the victims of, of, of the Nazis. Uh, what they get wrong, it's not, you know, big deal. Come on, you know, I, there are people that could probably, like, there are some insignia problems on the uniform, and honest to God, if that's really the point where you're at with criticism, you just need to stop and shut up and just <laughs> watch the movie. Um, there's, a, there's a subplot here with Marlena Dietrich's husband being executed in the Malmede case where American POWs had been killed during the Battle of the Bulge, and there, there were no executions and there were no army people on trial, so they get that part wrong. Um, it's trying to, to explain why Marlena Dietrich does and thinks some of the things that she thinks, and that's useful, but they, they, they get the history a little bit a little garbled. And the movie also, for the first time in U.S. theaters, features concentration camp footage. Now, this had been used as an exhibit in the, in the International Military Tribunal, but had never before appeared on a film release screen. Uh, it was not at the, at the real trial because it wasn't relevant and would have been prejudicial if, if the defendants weren't actually charged with, with operating and running concentration camps. But it's good that finally people could actually see, some, even momentarily, uh, some of what happened. So uh, again, the film for me gets, gets you know, if there, I don't know how, however many stars are possible, I give them all, all and then some. Um, the defendants that we talked about, okay, so we started with 16 and then we eventually get to 15 because one of the guys gets kicked because of, because of illness. These are the sentences and how long they actually served. <coughs> so acquitted, acquitted, uh, mistrial, uh, gets life, gets released in 56, gets 10 years, get released in, in 51. Uh, yeah, he also later got his law license back. Um, 10 years, out in 51, acquitted, life, got in 56, life, out in 56, seven years, out in 1950, got his that license back, life, got released in, in 50, got his license back. Um, if you're looking for an objective notion of justice, meaning did the people get what they deserve to get, probably not, but it was, 
at least for a little while, for a very, very brief moment, we had the will and the power and, and, and to do the right thing. And it didn't last long. But it was worth the effort to try to do it. And the same thing, I think, for me applies to the film. Is it a film that's going to appeal to most people, or you know, especially like in 2022? No, probably not. But I'm glad that somebody had the, the courage and, and, the, and, and the vision and the means to do it at all. So as, as always, OK, you know, if, if you get a chance to watch the film, if you, if you watched it yesterday, go back and watch it again today. Today's a new day. You can, you can get new, new truths out of it. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I, 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 we got Q&A here in a second. I'll be glad to, to, do, to answer, if I, if I can, anything you'd like to ask. Uh, there is one point I would like to clear up, though. Uh, my, my friend Brian Steed, some of you have probably attended his talk on best years of our lives. And I thought it was remarkable. I, I really enjoyed that very much. Brian, though, lied to you about one thing. He said that the movie Ben-Hur was the closest you could get to a perfect movie. <laughs> and, 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 and we all, we all know that that's just simply not true. It's 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 first of all Casablanca, and then Vertigo coming in as a second place, <laughs> and we can quibble about that later on. Uh, but oh yeah, one more thing. This is just your freebie take home, like Easter Easter present. Uh, in Germany, they don't like subtitled movies so much. They like voiceovers. Uh, Walter Sussengut uh, is the guy that the Germans always got to voice over Spencer Tracy. So if you're German and you grew up with, with like these films, this is, he's what you think Spencer Tracy sounded like. He did OK. He was, he's, he's good. Um, so turn it over to, 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 to smarter people. And, and that l l should we do some Q&A? Let's do Q&A. Thank you very much. So again, we'll ask that if you have a very well-formed question, not a comment, <laughs> that you, you come up and use the microphones so our friends at home can hear. And um, as people stop asking questions here, I will ask questions that we have from people who are watching on YouTube. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you 99% answered the question, but I would still like to ask it. There was no judge, Nazi judge, that was hanged or executed at all. There, there were no death sentences hang, or handed out at this, this trial. Any other judge trial that were no executions? The, 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 the only ones involving German judges, this is case three of 12 that occurred at the, at the NMT proceedings, and this was the one all about judges. No executions, though? Not of judges, no, sir. Thank you. So an interesting follow-up on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you speak a bit about the fate of the People's Court judge that presided over the uh, defendants in the July 44 plot? Yeah, the interesting he, he, fate he, of he, his. He was on, he was on the, the, the losing end of, of, of that. He, he was, there was an Allied air raid on the courtroom in, in Berlin, and he was killed in, in the, the air raid, which is just such a shame that that, that happened. Um, and it actually saved some of the defendants that were on trial when he was, he was killed by the air raid. They, they, they weren't put to death. The fall or the summer? Uh, that would be late 1944 or maybe January 45. His name was Roland Freisler, was the guy's name. Yes, Chrysler, yes. You said there were uh, uh, three movies that made you want to be a lawyer. Yes. This one, the, another one I gather was Inherit the Wind. Yes, sir. And what was the third one? Gregory Peck to Kill a Mockingbird. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. It's, it's another one, too, where I, just, just watching his courtroom thing, I, I could sit there and watch that on a continuous loop and be really happy the whole time. I forgot we're not live streaming, so there aren't any <laughs> questions from home. <laughs> should, but should, you know should, what? Should, should, should we pause for the moment and give people a chance to? Um, <laughs> but you know what? People can still watch this later, because it will be online by probably tomorrow. So friends and family who missed it, send them online, and they will see it. They just can't watch it this second. Is that it? Does anyone have anything else? Well, wonderful. You, thank you. Thank you.